Hey, you're listening to Ty Bollinger of CancerTruth.net. You're also listening to Justin and Kate with Extreme Health Radio. These guys are great. Enjoy listening to them. I always do. Welcome, Welcome to Extreme Health Radio. Extreme Health Radio. Where natural solutions to almost every health condition are out there. Are out there. Join us on our journey to find them. Now, now here are your hosts. Broadcasting from sunny Southern California around the world. Justin and Kate Stellman. Well, 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 here we are again, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> back-to-back episode. Back-to-back episode. So never a dull moment for the Stallman. <laughs> never a dull moment. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Southern California. Once again, it's uh, nice and blue skies. It's actually been a bit cloudy lately. Good old is, June gloom, they call it here. Yeah. The marine layer. We have uh, a lot to be thankful for, that's Today for sure. Today is gorgeous. I'm thrilled. My name is Justin, and I want to wish you a pleasant good afternoon or good evening to you wherever you are around the world. I know we have listeners in over 100 countries, so I hope you're having a great day, whatever you're up to. And this is ExtremeHealthRadio.com, and this is Justin and my wife, Kate. And we're broadcasting uh, worldwide from Southern California, so yeah. uh, we're glad to have you join us. And uh, we do shows four days a week on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday. And it's a lot of fun bringing this really great information to you. We have a lot of fun with it. So uh, I'm glad that you're on the call. And if you'd like to follow our work, you can do that on Facebook. If you're interested in joining our community, extremehealthradio.com slash Facebook. And you can click the like button on there and you'll be, like off, us. <laughs> and you'll be off and running. I don't know what happens after that, but <laughs> you'll be good to go. Uh, for reference, this is Thursday, June 27th, 2013. And this is episode number 121, so feel free to sit back and relax and not take any notes. Uh, we'll take all no- all the notes for you, actually, Kate. I will take the notes for Kate you. Kate will take all the notes. <laughs> so uh, I hope you enjoy the episode. And if you'd like to join the show, you can do that, Justin, at ExtremeHealthRadio.com or... Kate, K-A-T-E, at ExtremeHealthRadio.com. And another feature we have is a voicemail feature, so if you want to re- record... A question to any of our guests, you can go to extremehealthradio.com slash voicemail and record it right from your computer. And it's a great way to interact with the guests and get your question answered and a lot of fun that yeah, way. Yeah, that's been fun lately to play those. Yeah, we got one of those today. So We did. For Daniel. And um, if you'd like to support us financially, you can do that if you ever make purchases on Amazon. I know a lot of people do. Uh, you can go to extremehealthradio.com slash Amazon anytime you make a purchase there. It doesn't have to be health related, and that would be a great way to support our work. We'll get a couple bucks for it, and that'll help pay all the bills around here. Yep. And we've got some great shows coming up. Uh, next couple guests are Konstantin Monastersky. You're pretty good with that, That's actually. That's quite a name, isn't it? You hardly it? butcher it, ever. <laughs> you have once. <laughs> I have once, or twice. Or twice. Uh, his website is gutsense.org, and he's written a book called The Fiber Menace, and written a lot of information about... Uh, how damaging fiber is to the body. So we've had him on once before, and he's sort of backed by popular demand. Uh, a lot of people talking about him. And then another guest that we've had a lot of people talk about is Chris Kaler. Yeah. From chriskaler.com. I think he's .net, isn't is he? Is he .net? And he's got uh, a practice there in Canada with energetic medicine. I've been working with him quite a bit. He is a fascinating individual. He is. And so uh, he's going to be on the show again. So if you have any questions about energetic medicine, things like that, you can always uh, email me and I will ask him any question you have. And uh, today, I'm really excited. We had to sort of reschedule our interview uh, with Daniel Vitalis last time. And we were really upset about that because we love Daniel Vitalis and his work. And uh, his work has changed my life. And if you've heard him, and I'm sure m- many of you have, uh, I'm sure he'll change your life as well. He's doing lots of great things out in the world today. Uh, he's got a website called surthrival.com where you could buy lots of his amazing products there. And he's also got danielvitalis.com. And uh, today's going to be part two of a four part series we're doing with Daniel. And this is going to be on water. And we're going to be talking about all kinds of the mystical, crazy things that's going on with water that you probably Mm -hmm. haven't heard about. I can't wait. So, Daniel, are you in Maine these days? I sure am. 
In Maine. You're back in Maine for the summer months, huh? <laughs> Tuck, tucked up into the corner of the United States. And for some people listening, they may not know that Maine is actually part of the United States, but uh, it is, in fact. I've heard about that. Yeah, there's rumors going on about that. <laughs> We're getting a geography lesson, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. So uh, you're done with your pilgrimage there in Arizona and you're back in Maine. And are you growing a garden or doing anything fun like Man, that? You know, I do have a garden and I am really grateful for Alexander, my partner, who really tends to it much more than I get the opportunity to. Um, so it's not quite up to the standard I would like it to be, but it's definitely, you know, I put together a seed package uh, for my website, Sir Thrival, and we gathered together all these different heirloom seeds. Um, and so we're able to, to grow some of those. But, you know, I'm looking forward to the future when things relax a little bit more. I can grow a little bit more than I am now. Yeah, that's excellent. That's so, sort of similar how we are here with Kate. She does a lot of the work in the garden and she uh, loves it. I love it. I love it too. Good but, for the uh, soul. Yeah, you're, you're in here uh, typing away. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good to have a garden, isn't it? Yeah. So what kinds of things are you working on uh, lately, Daniel? Well, I think I was telling you guys just before the call, you know, I've got to focus right now on emergency medicine, which is an old passion of mine. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting to be involved. And, and when I say that, what I mean is uh, I'm studying as an EMT right now to work the back of ambulances sort of locally. And it's a fascinating thing to get involved with mainstream medicine. You know, I mean, as you guys know, that's mainstream medicine is not really my <laughs> philosophy focus. <laughs> but I got to say, you know, I have I've come to see this thing, which is that if you uh, are in a traumatic incident, for example, like you were in a car accident, something really traumatic happens to your body, you want that mainstream medicine to be there to uh, get you stable again. Uh, But once you're stable, you don't want that mainstream medicine giving you any, I mean, you don't want them at all involved in your long-term care. Uh, What you want then is natural medicine. You want herbal medicine. You want nutritional medicine. You want energetic medicine. That's what keeps you healthy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're involved in a car accident and you're bleeding out, you don't want the, you know, energetic healer there and the herbalist to work on you, do you? You want that person who can keep the blood (laughs) in your bucket and get you stable again. Uh, So it's funny because it's like mainstream medicine has created all this great stuff for emergencies and they're trying to apply it long term. And it's really funny to watch because it fails. It's actually not funny to watch. It's really, it's really sad to watch. Uh, but, you know, and conversely, herbal medicine is really great. You know, it's a passion of mine for my long-term care. But like I said, you know, you need other interventions. I have this funny story in my past. I remember watching a friend uh, get bit by a diamondback rattlesnake in uh-huh. uh, Arizona. And we were with, you know, our, our crew of, you know, herbal loving fun loving hippies and and everybody's like what are we gonna do and they were they were grabbing all these different essential oils and you know (laughs) trying to stick his finger in clay and trying to do you know they were trying to do reiki on him and obviously his hand just starts swelling up and his arms well and you know he ended up in the hospital almost lost his arm and luckily was able to save it Mm. Uh, but it was one of those instances where you want that sort of mainstream medical care but then you want to get out of there as soon as possible yeah get away from there as soon as possible so you can go back to your natural healing. So, you know, I'm really into balance and, and trying to develop both skills and uh, looking toward this sort of herbal EMT idea for the future. I love it. I love it. You know, I kind of want to crack a joke here, but in all seriousness, do you sit in those classes? And uh, I know before the show, you're talking about how it's kind of surreal to sit there and listen to what they're all talking about in terms of their care for people. But do you have a hard time kind of you know, sitting there and being silent or raising questions just to get people to think and not really want, you know, having the right mindset behind it or any of those. Well, kinds of it, the level of ignorance is shocking. It's, it's true. It's been a really good check in for me because I'd say for the last, you know, decade, I've been living in a bubble of uh, one, um, you know, healthy people, uh, two, you know, be, it goes beyond healthy. It go, it's, it's people who have a spiritual commitment to life. Uh huh. Right. And where, what I'm surrounded with in this class is interesting because these people are, are, don't have that. I mean, that's what most of the mainstream is really, really lacking. Right. It's not just that they're, they don't understand how to eat and how to take care of themselves. It's that they don't believe that life is magical, special or spiritual. Um, and they've been somehow, somehow they've been tricked into relinquishing that most important thing. And so these, it's really what's strange to watch is this. I think a lot of the people who participate in emergency medicine do it because they know at some point they're going to need it. Mm-hmm. And they're all like getting, you know, they're in there. It's funny. Here's the funniest part. Do, going over things like the cardiovascular system while these people are eating donuts. 
<laughs> right? Go watching them come back from Dunkin' Donuts with a with a styrofoam coffee cup, mm. you know, and then get, talk about you know things like strokes and things like heart attacks and how to treat wow. them, but never even making the connection that they're creating them. Wow. And that's that? been, you know, and they're just trying to understand. I go in there with six mason jars of smoothies and liquids <laughs> every day. And, yeah. and they, you know, and I, I get called, you know, they make jokes and they, they laugh about it and they don't understand it. And You got a hyperbaric they, oxygen tank next to you. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, here's what's funny. They laugh at the, the glass mason jar. Uh, but they're, you know, I've just been blown away that people, st- I'm blown away that styrofoam cups are even legal. I mean, here are these people, they're drinking out of a cup that's going to take six million years to biodegrade, they're only going to use it for a minute and a half. Mm. And it's going to take six million years to go away, if it will. And it's so inexpensive. And to me, if a thing is going to last six million years polluting the earth, you would think it would be real expensive at least. Yeah. Right? Like, shouldn't Mm. it cost like $500 to get a styrofoam cup? Yeah. You would think. Like, yeah, you would think that's what's logical, but of course we're in a world that's inverse, and so, yeah, you know, it is. It's really strange to sit in there, but it's also, it's kind of, you know, I did it years ago, and I really fought back against a lot of what people were talking about then, and here I am. It's sort of coming full circle a decade later, taking the class again and knowing when to speak up and when to keep my mouth shut, yeah. and when people are ready to hear something and when they're not, and uh, you know, a lot of these people are not. Um, so, uh, letting the power of presence. Uh, you know, seep into people's minds. Mm-hmm. I imagine that uh, you might be like the smart, the, the smart Alec in the back of class. The teacher's not too impressed <laughs> with what you're talking. About. You know what? But the, but then I have an, a near perfect grade average because my understanding of mm. the human body. So it's been really funny to watch because yeah, I am sort of that class clown, but I'm also that like class valedictorian in there. So mm-hmm. it's it's pretty funny <laughs> to play that role. But also, you know. Ultimately, the people who are in there do want to help people. Um, uh, unfortunately, my opinion is, and again, I have a history in emergency response and such. And, and one of the things you always learn is this, you know, don't try to help somebody unless you're safe first. Mm. Uh, because otherwise, you may also now become another victim and you may create, you know, more problems. So now you need more rescuers there, right? And that just makes sense. If you can't swim, don't try to rescue somebody who's drowning because you may start drowning now and now you, there's two of you in the water. So similarly, you know, these people want to help people medically. You know, people in the medical system want to help people, but haven't learned how to help their own health yet. Mm. And so, of course, what they're doing is they're creating more health chaos in the world because they haven't first healed themselves. And that's an ancient admonition, you know, doctor heal thyself, physician heal thyself. But of course, you know, nobody's following that anymore. The world's gone crazy. Um, And, you know, I don't know if you guys ever get to it, but I'm at this point in my life where I feel like, um, you know, there's a time to try to patch the hole in the Titanic and there's a time to realize you just got to get off the boat. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I'm on the get off the boat path right now <laughs> wow does, that's well said does that mean moving or changing locations or what, what no, does that it, mean it means that my my hope that we're i don't think see things getting a lot easier on planet earth before they get a bit harder and i think this is time to you know the twister gets close enough you go down in the basement you batten down the hatches uh-huh. right yeah there's a time at which okay running around and telling everybody that there's a twister coming there's a time for that and then there's a time to go make sure you're safe too Hmm. Um, and I think that's kind of where we're at looking around at what's happening in the world. Um, at least, you know, it's not like I, I'm going to discontinue my outreach cause that's where my passion really is one of my huge passions, but I'm much more focused right now on who, you know, where to put that energy hmm. because I think a lot of, a lot of ground's been lost and <laughs> I, you know, I've just come into peace with that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Cause like you were talking about earlier with uh, the disconnect and people drinking out of styrofoam cups and, yet learning about the cardiovascular system at the same time. And, you know, I see it every day. We've talked about it before, you know, going to the gym or going to the, you know, traditional doctor, you see this all the time. And the whole disconnect, you know, we're going to be talking about water on this show. And it's just really interesting how that same disconnect happens with people and their views about something so seemingly basic as water but it's just interesting how this kind of stuff people just don't make that connection. Why even in the is? even in the nutrition and health world, and I, I sometimes you know in meditating on this call coming up and doing this interview with you guys, I was just thinking about 
I'm I'm surprised at how few people in the world of health and nutrition because there's some we have some true um, brilliant minds in our field who are out sharing this information but how few people have really put any energy into focusing on water I'm amazed that I'm one of the few voices out there I know it is opening up and it's spreading but it's shocking to me because of the amount of water that our bodies are made of. I mean, it's it's like the cliche thing to say, oh, you know, you're 70% water. Um, but the amount of water we're made of and the amount of water we need to consume every day, that it's not considered the fundamental um, building block of nutrition is bizarre. It's truly bizarre. It's bizarre that the food is so, we're, we focus so much on the food. You're made of food to a degree, but, but you're far more made out of water, right? I mean, how much of your body is food? I mean, if we were to you know, burn a person down to ash and, and we'd have a small handful of minerals left over, but mostly what you are is water. So it is amazing. We just sort of missed this thing. I don't understand how. Yeah, it's interesting because water is the basis of life and you know it should be really the core of the food we eat. But like you were saying, water is just completely looked over. And you know, I think it might be part of that whole mechanistic approach that people have towards uh, you know, health and towards Body. our bodies. And they think we're just kind of robots and machines and, um, and water is just a solution that they don't really ever think about. And I think it probably comes from that whole mindset. Wouldn't you think? Yeah. So water is, it's interesting. Okay. It's clear. Uh, so it appears to be simple, <laughs> right? It's right. like, it's clear. Uh, it has no real smell. I mean, it, it almost shouldn't have a taste, right? There's an, uh, organoleptic experience, you know, there's a, a, a mouthfeel and a flavor experience, but it doesn't really have much of a taste. So it's apparently very simple. And then, you know, this is going to sound a little bit esoteric here, but human beings since really early on, we've been obsessed with technology. And I don't mean computers. I mean, from the time we started napping Flint into arrowheads, that's our, you know, our first technologies, um, to the development of cordage from plant fiber and making cord and rope to developing the atlatl and then later the bow to uh, developing containers and developing fabrics and eventually developing paper. I and mean, we've been, obs- our story is the story of us making stuff <laughs> and these different industries that lead us You know, it's one of the challenges with being kind of a Luddite in our culture because I get a little freaked out by where all the computer technology is going, but then I have to ask myself, well, you know, do I think paper's not a technology? You know, is is it better to read books than read off the internet? And the books are a technology, right? They're new too. They've only been around a short time as well when you you think about it. So, I mean, we've we've been at this technology thing a really long time. Um, and it's getting weirder and weirder, but we've been at technology the whole time. The thing about water is water actually destroys almost all of our technologies, right? You, when you build something, you try to keep water away from it. Right, right. Right, water will ruin almost anything that you make. And so we've almost, it's almost like water is the antithesis of our focus, which is to build technological things, right? You don't want to float your MacBook <laughs> uh, on, in water, right? You don't, you, <laughs> don't? you don't want to drop your phone in the toilet. Right. You don't want rust on your car. Water is almost so. It's funny because you you mentioned being mechanistic, and I guess that's what triggered this piece of the conversation. Is that um, from the mechanistic perspective, water is an enemy, whereas from the biological perspective, to say that life forms need water is is one of the greatest understatements possible. Water is the, f- the, there is no life without water. Water is life. And in fact, as we'll get into later on, water may be a lot, even more than that. Uh, there might be even more to it than that. So why do you think we lose water? Because I've heard that, uh, aren't you something like 70% or 90% they say water when you're born and then when you're, you know, when you die, you get brittle and then you're about 50, 50% or something. <laughs> Uh, is that true? Well, it's like a, a corpse is 50, 50 to 55%. It is. It is true. Um, okay. We definitely, de- part of the aging process is dehydrating, but part of the aging process is also accumulating more stuff that isn't water. So that's part of why that ratio shifts a little bit too. Okay. Because when you're an infant, you don't have a lot of bone material. Like you're very low in osteous material. You know, that's, it's, uh, this is a delicate thing here, but, but you can bounce a baby from two stories and they can survive that sometimes without injury. Mm. Right, you try to drop a person who's an adult from that height, 
it's not good because you have all this osteous material. And that, when I say osteous, I'm talking about bone material that's made out of uh, apatite or uh, calcium phosphate. And that stuff breaks. It's a crystal. So it snaps. Huh. But a baby hasn't really developed that yet. So um, this is something that's actually really valuable for listeners here. So your bones, when, when you see a dog bone or something, you know, you see a bone uh, in, a, in an anatomy class it appears to be this really solid object because typically when you see a bone, the, the bone has been baked to remove all the, uh, the uh, collagen from it, all of the cartilaginous material. Mm -hmm. But if you took a fresh bone out of a person and you soak, let's say that you soaked it in vinegar, all of the calcium phosphate, all of the hard stuff would dissolve out into the acid of the vinegar, if that makes sense. It would all dissolve away and you'd be left with something that looked just like that bone, except you could tie it in knots. It'd be like uh, made of rubber almost. Oh, it's wow. all collagen. That's in your bones too. Uh, but if you took a bone out of a person and you baked it, all the collagen would go away. You'd be left with just the hard stuff, if that makes sense. Your bone's made out of both parts. Right? That's why your bone has a little flex to it. Mm -hmm. When you're a baby, you don't have that hard stuff yet. You just have the soft, rubbery stuff. And that's why babies are so flexy. Stick in their yeah. feet um, in their mouth. And yeah. As you, yeah, and as you get older, you accumulate more and more of the hard stuff. And some people ac start accumulating that hard stuff in places they shouldn't, like in their arteries, in their pineal gland, in their uh, solid organs. And these calcium deposits over time are part of the reason why a person has less water because they have more hard stuff oh, as they age. That's interesting. So w what are some things about water that like the average person Wouldn't just know. does not understand? I think that, you know, a lot of people might be stumbling on on this uh, show with you and, you know, maybe just don't understand anything about water. Uh, what are some things that just kind of pop to your mind that people don't understand about water? Well, let's start at the beginning. I think that everybody understands that water comes from the earth. But I think one really fascinating thing is that very few people actually um, ever get their water from the earth. Uh -huh. and so we have this really interesting thing where water is the foundation of all the ecosystems of the planet. And obviously ecosystems are where our food comes from and where our water comes from. Yet most of us get our water, let's face it, average person gets their water either from a tap or a muni let's say a municipal system. Mm -hmm. So essentially from a tap um, or they get it from uh, purchasing it from bottled water. And I think that basically covers most people's water consumption, at least here in the United States, in Canada, in the UK. So very few people are actually going out and gathering their water anymore. So one of the first thing I think that's really interesting is people have, um, they, it's it's almost like I liken it to when you have uh, the when people believe they can't pray directly to their creator that they need a first a priest or something to, to pray for them like there's an intermediary between them and their spiritual source right we have and interestingly the French word for a spring is the source uh, la source and the source is where water comes from it comes up from these springs and we don't get it directly we always have to either buy it from our city or we buy it from a store. And I think that's really interesting because when we drink our water, there's some people just have this idea that water works like food, right? We know we're a big, long tube. The tube starts at your lips and it ends at your anus. And you eat food and it kind of goes through the tube and comes out the other side. Mm -hmm. And I think people think water might be like that. Like you drink it and it goes through a long tube that comes out at your urethra and you pee it out. Uh -huh. But it, it, does, it doesn't work like that. What happens is when you start drinking water, it immediately starts being absorbed right into your bloodstream um, from your stomach, from your small intestine and your large intestine. So the water you drink is your blood uh, starting within a couple of minutes. That water is already your blood. What if when that you, water is not uh, a good source? Like let's say that water is the tap water. Does that, it still becomes your blood? So that's your blood. Okay. So you, your blood would be made out of tap water, right? So my first point I want to make is I think it's really interesting that we're all buying our water either from the city. We might not see that directly. It might be tucked into our taxes. Mm -hmm. But we either buy our blood from our city or we buy our blood from our store. And that, I think that's a really weird thing because nature's set it up so that all the organisms of the planet could freely drink water and build their blood, build their cerebral spinal fluid, build their tears out of, you know, stuff that's freely given. So once we start purchasing it, we're getting into a weird kind of 
it's almost like a type of slavery, which is really interesting, right? We work in order to purchase the fluid that makes our blood and it's getting more expensive. And if you go to the store to buy it, of course, you know, it's more expensive than gasoline currently, right? right by right. the gallon. So uh, it's rather expensive to build your blood this way. So that's the first kind of point I want to bring up. And then you asked the question, you know, what about the quality of it? Mm-hmm. And so let's talk about that for a minute. Let's start talking about tap water because there's been, you guys have no doubt seen it. Are you guys in Southern California? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. So you've you've been seeing this resurgence in the tap water. Um, there's like a tap water movement now, mm. right? And understandably, there's a movement to get away from bottled water because of all the plastics. And so we see this thing of like drink tap water, like it's a it's an ecological choice that people are making. Um, I think when we start looking at tap water, the really obvious first thing is chlorine is present in that water. Mm. And when you drink it, that chlorine is present now in your blood and moves throughout your body. But it also goes through your digestive tract. And um, we know that our digestive tract is an ecosystem. It's a forest Mm -hmm. of microbes. And those microbes are critical to our health. They're critical to our digestion. And they are ultimately really the first line of defense of our immune system. And when we start to, we know that if we take antibiotics, for instance, that we wipe out populations, uh, whole populations of organisms that live within our gut tube. And we need to keep those uh, viable or else we get sick. Uh, We develop overgrowths of pathogens. So one of the things that's interesting is you can think of chlorine as an antibiotic. That's essentially what it is. The reason that we use chlorine in tap water is because it's an antibiotic. The idea is that if you wanted to put, if picture where you guys are right now in Southern California, and then picture where the water is coming from that you get out of your tap, and then imagine how, if you could see through the ground, just try to imagine the pipe infrastructure that brings that water to you. How far does that water have to travel through pipes in order to get to you? We're talking about a lot of piping. And along the way, lots of that piping is broken Mm. and rusted and cracked. Now, additionally, the same thing is true with when you poop and you pee. That stuff gets taken away. It has to go through just as much piping. And where does that piping run? Right alongside the water piping. And that piping is broken and rusted too. Most of the United States water infrastructure piping infrastructure is from the uh, Lincoln administration. Really? Seriously? Just, let me, let, can I, just, I just want to repeat that. Yeah. Most of the, the United States water pipe infrastructure was built during the Lincoln administration. Um, we're, one of the issues we're facing uh, civilly, I guess, is that we're coming up on a time where most of it needs replacing. Um, but can you imagine a nationwide water piping infrastructure replacement program? I mean, think about the the monumental task of doing that. So what has to happen is uh, legally tap water uh, has to be delivered to your actual faucet with chlorine still in it so that organisms can't get in that water and be delivered to your tap. Otherwise, you'd turn on your tap, drink that water, you could get sick right, from organisms like, let's say, Giardia, some kind of protozoa. Mm-hmm. So that's what the, the chlorine is there. But also, this water is getting mingled with sewage. Mm. It just happens. It's a result of all this piping that's breaking down and running alongside, if that makes sense. So, of course, we deliver an antibiotic to the water. So, you know, and then people think, well, I'll just filter that out. And so they get a filter like a Brita filter. Um, Brita, incidentally, is owned by Clorox, which is funny because they make bleach and then they make <laughs> these filters that people use to take bleach out, right? But, yeah. um, but examine those filters and what you'll see is the statement on there removes the taste and smell of chlorine. <laughs> oh. uh, but you won't see removes chlorine, it just removes the taste and smell of chlorine. Oh my gosh, um, wow. So chlorine is, of course, getting through that. And then another issue being, of course, that we shower in this stuff and we bathe in this stuff and, and we end up ingesting a lot more of it through our lungs than we do through drinking it. So, you know, once we heat that water up um, and we lock ourselves in a small containment unit like a shower uh, that's full of steamed, volatilized chlorofluorocarbon, uh, uh, trihalomethanes, I'm sorry, um, like chlorine, which turns to chloroform gas, a trihalomethane. And then we inhale that and that ends up in our blood. So what ends up happening is our bloodstream gets contaminated with chlorine. Um, so that's one issue that we're facing is tap water is, is no bueno in this way. Um, but the other piece is this fluoride issue. I mean, probably almost, I can't imagine there's very many listeners who, out there right now who are going, yeah, like I, I really believe in this fluoridation program. Right, right. But just, I doubt that. 
<laughs> but, you know, <laughs> as a reminder, um, you know, it's incredibly toxic. Um, and it's for human beings, it's a neurotoxin. Um, and there's a lot of really good uh, studies out there now on this. And one of the things that's emerged is that um, when children drink fluorinated water, they end up with lower IQs. <laughs> so let's just let's just understand that from the beginning that that fluoride lowers IQs it's a it dumbs people down um it's been shown uh, you know that it it destroys willpower and it's been used for that specifically in prison camp populations during the Nazi regime and in communist Russia it was used to pacify prison populations now wow. it's in our water supply um Technically, this sodium fluoride is a drug. You know, technically, when I say that, I mean um, according to, um, like, let's say the FDA. It's a drug. So this means that our water supply is being drugged with fluoride. Wow. I, I personally feel that this is something that needs, you know, people should have that, the choice about that. And I guess, you know, ultimately they do. They've opted into a system that drugs the water and therefore they've chosen to drink that water. Now, at the physiological level, fluoride is very similar in its electrical makeup to calcium. And so what happens is when we start to get excesses of this fluoride into our body, our body starts to incorporate it into that osteous tissue we were talking about before, that uh -huh. bony matrix of calcium phosphate. So it starts bonding the fluoride to the phosphorus the way that calcium does in our bones. Oh, and so okay. it ends up becoming part of our bone matrix. Now, we know that this happens in the teeth, and the teeth are bones, right? So teeth are specialized modified bones that protrude through the skin. Um, but when fluoride is, you know, we know fluoride is incorporated into the teeth, that also tells us it's incorporated into the bony structure. Now, the thing about fluoride is it doesn't have the same flex in teeth or bones that it, that calcium does. Okay. So when it's incorporated into bone, it tends to create brittleness in the, there's a more likelihood of chipping Hmm. And so actually it creates a more brittle, chippable tooth. Yeah. It is harder. So the idea was that we'll make, we can't, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so funny. It's like, <laughs> okay, we're getting cavities. Cavities are in a tooth. Tooth is a bone. Therefore, there's a disease of the bones that are rampant in our people. Our people have holes developing in their teeth. There's a bone disease. We don't know why we're causing it. I mean, obviously, we know why we're causing it. But the government says, we don't know why, what's causing it. The dental industry says, we don't know why people have this bone disease. But let's put a drug in that will harden the teeth. Maybe that'll work. Wow. But what ended up happening is it made the teeth more brittle. And the side effect is lower IQs and more passive population. Now, <laughs> um, one would really have to ask if that was understood or not understood at the time, I tend to think it was understood. And um, of course, you know, another issue is that this is an industrial byproduct and, you know, there, it was a waste product of aluminum milling. And essentially the, they, were, they were left with all this fluoride and no idea what to do with it and having to pay to get rid of it. And now we buy it to drug ourselves with it in our water supply. Isn't that fascinating? Um, I thought, you know, I bet you there's a connection between cavities and osteoporosis then. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Ding, ding. Good so, <laughs> Right. So, uh, all right. So the, now here's the thing. The fluoride targets more than anything else in the body. We're eating, it's incorporated into osteous tissue, bone tissue, more than anywhere else in the body. Uh -huh. Now, that's a hard tissue. Now, there's also soft tissue targets where this stuff accumulates, now, this is a really critical piece of data here. The number one soft tissue target site in the body, in other words, the, the tissue where fluoride is most easily incorporated into that's a soft tissue is the pineal gland in the brain. That pineal gland at the very center, the core of the brain, is what every spiritual culture through time is called the third eye. Mm. And that, that has light been, receptors been too, doesn't it? It's, it, it, it does have photoreceptors, yeah. Oh. And it's where our serotonin, melatonin, and DMT are regulated. And um, wow. it is uh, believed in many cultures to be crucial to spiritual development. Now, what happens is the average person now in America by age 18 has a completely rock-hard, fluoridated, calcified pineal gland. Um, I've personally got to see this in MRIs where 
you know, people have brought me MRIs. I, you know, I met a radiologist at a conference at one, t- at one point. He brought to me a, a whole stack of MRIs to show me young people's pineal glands, totally hardened and calcified. I would, um, I would ask the listener to stretch this out, try to make the connection between what I referenced at the beginning of our call, which was that the average American has, though they might not realize it, willfully given up any connection to spiritualism, or any spiritual connection to the earth, any mm-hmm. spiritual connection to creation or a creator. They've relinquished that. Interestingly, their pineal gland has been turned into a small pebble. Huh. Um, you fascinating. Know, I wonder now, if there's a connection too between, uh, this just came to my mind right now, uh, that what are the ages where the military, mm. you know, I know this is kind of completely different, you know, uh, conversation here, but just really quickly, you know, they go into high schools and they recruit, you know, 16, 17 year old kids. I wonder if the pineal gland has any contributing factor into them you know, just Making sort of that huge throwing. Yeah, going along with that. Would they want? Would they want to do that kind of work? Well, I, I want to just add a caveat here. I, <laughs> you know, I, I train and, and hang with a lot of people who've done that kind of work, and there's a difference, I think, between there are people born with a desire to be part of the warrior caste. Uh-huh. This is an ancient part of humanity is a desire to be a warrior. But for that warrior to go and do injustices, see, most people who want to be warriors want to uh, do it because they believe in justice and in protecting people. But then that gets flipped on them and they're asked to do such horrible things, such inhumane and unjust things that they develop you know, psychological diseases afterward from what they've done because they've so violated their code of ethics. But could you get a person with a healthy pineal gland to do that? That's a good question. I mm. wonder. Right. Or someone who perhaps who hasn't been born in a hospital to do something mm. like that. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, you know, um, I, what I want to say next is um, I had an opportunity to um, tour a local water municipality, um, sorry, municipal water plant uh-huh. treatment facility here in Maine, um, about probably, I'm going to say about six years ago, I visited a local, uh, well, I called up actually the, the, um, the, what would they call them? The water, I'm not sure what they're called, the water board of my, my town. Okay. And I asked if I could see inside one of the municipal plants. And it was a pretty strange thing. They, they're very, you know, anytime now you want to visit governmental infrastructure now because of this, you know, massive terrorism fear that's pervaded our culture. Uh, It's not easy to do. Like if I did that today, I don't know if they'd even let me in now, but they somehow through some, through some um, (laughs) serendipitous thing, I don't know, they, they let me come and tour. You know, I said, I want to see where the water comes from that I'm, that comes to my tab. So anyway, what I learned from that, now we went in, there was a massive tank, as you can imagine. Now the water plant that I visited, the water was actually drawn from wells. The water came, was treated with a, there was a massive uh, chlorine tank, and that's where the chlorine came from. Now, there was two other tanks, and at first, I wasn't expecting to see those. I thought I was going to see chlorine and fluoride. Fluoride was in a separate room because the fumes from it were so caustic that it ate everything. Everything around it was dissolving. So, they had to keep that in its separate room because the fluoride would destroy piping, circuitry, electronics, the other tanks. <laughs> So that was off by itself. Wow. So I was like, what are these two other tanks? You know, this is really fascinating. Yeah. One of them was um, lye, sodium hydroxide. The other one was phosphoric acid. Uh, phosphoric acid is in Coca-Cola. And it's, it's what allows Coca-Cola to dissolve a tooth mm-hmm. or why Coca-Cola can be used to clean blood stains off pavement. It's, in, it's very acidic. Then sodium hydroxide, lye, I don't know if you've ever, if you guys remember Red Devil, that was a, a drain cleaner. Oh, It's yeah. a caustic alkali. Now, if you take sodium hydroxide, if you were to put your, you know, mix a little water with it, put your finger in it, it's caustic. It'll start eating through your tissue. Uh, so will phosphoric acid. <laughs> what they do is they have electronically, they inject the water with bits of this alkali and bits of the acid to maintain a regular pH in the water. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because if they don't, the minerals will fall out of solution and clog up the piping infrastructure. So computers regulate the injection of a caustic alkali and a caustic acid along with the 
uh, so with the fluoride and the chlorine. So there, it's a chemical cocktail being mixed into the water. Wow. And those people out there who are saying, like, your tap water is as good as bottled water. Go ahead and drink tap water. It's bad to use the plastic bottles and all of that. I understand what their, where their heart is and what they mean, mm-hmm. but they need need to understand this stuff. What they're taking are industrial chemicals. These chemicals are not meant for human consumption. Human beings should not be consuming sodium hydroxide, phosphoric acid, sodium fluoride, or chlorine. These things are incredibly toxic, and they all carry warning labels directly on them because they're dangerous to biology. Um, so I just need to people to know that that's what's going on with tap water. And that's in a town where we, drew our, we draw our water from wells. What happens if you're drawing your water from uh, municipal recycling systems? Mm. Because a lot of towns, what they do is their tap water, a lot of it comes from recycled septic water, sorry, uh, um, sewage water. So people don't often realize that, you know, you guys have heard about if you go out to um, a place like San Francisco, there's this, you know, you hear these, you see these articles about there being 50 different pharmaceuticals in the tap water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why? Is somebody out there dumping pharmaceuticals in? What do you end up hearing? Do you, have you guys heard why that's in there? We have not, no. Okay, so, you, so if you dig a little deeper, you'll hear there's birth control pills or birth control I- medications are in the water. Mm-hmm. There are um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor drugs in the water. There are, um, uh, I mean, just all of, all, a, a suite of pharmaceutical drugs. Because people flush them down the toilet. Are these at homeopathic levels, do you think? Or are they actually in bigger No, particles? they're at detectable. No, homeopathic levels are undetectable in laboratory. These are at laboratory detectable levels. Wow. Um, they, they're in there because people flush them and because people pee and poop them out. Uh-huh. And what's funny is I've never heard anyone ask the next question, which is, wait a second, there's toilet water in my drinking water? <laughs> right. You people would, should know so that. So people poop them and pee them out and then that goes into my water. So what happens is that water flushed down the toilet gets cleaned up and then put back into the system and people drink it again. Now, remember I said before, when you drink water, water doesn't run down a little tube and come out your pee hole, right? Uh (laughs) It it goes in your blood and then that blood gets filtered by the kidneys and what you pee out your urine is blood plasma. Your urine is blood plasma. The the kidneys are a very fine sieve and they don't let what they don't let blood cells and platelets come through. So white blood cells, red blood cells and platelets are held back by the kidneys and the the plasma, the liquid part of blood comes out and that's your urine. Interesting. It's mixed with a couple other things. In other words, people in big cities are drinking each other's urine. Uh-huh. Yeah. Which is everybody else's blood plasma. And what do you think so you about you mentioned homeopathy uh-huh. at the homeopathic level what happens when you drink everybody else's blood thousands of mil- say millions of people's blood are mixed into your tap water Well that's similar that- to what's going on with conventional milk too right they kind of mix all the milks all into one big vat right They do um slightly different but yeah I mean ultimately yeah it's interesting. Have you heard any of the things that's going on with uh, the chemotherapy getting into the mm. to the uh, water systems and things? Whatever drugs somebody's taking, say that you know the 16-year-old girl who's just been put on birth control pills and is maybe taking an antidepressant. She goes pee, flushes the toilet. The rem- the antidepressant and the 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 birth control pill that's in her blood that makes it down into her urine does not get cleaned out of the water supply, gets put back in. Now, we know that when you mix drugs, drugs have side effects. That's just, yeah, that's what they just do. Multiple drugs mixed together can have really negative side effects caused by the interactions. Right. But nobody tests what happens when you mix 50 of them. Yeah. We see, oh, this drug and that drug together, bad. But we don't see, oh, what happens when you take 50 at subclinical doses? <laughs> so that's, a, that's oh one gosh. of the experiments going on. Now, it's so, there's so many variables and it's so hard to control it that we see these syndromes emerging in people that we're not really sure what's going on with people. We see endocrine syndromes and immunosyndromes. 
Um, but they can't necessarily be traced back because there's so many variables. And this is certainly a variable going on in a lot of urban centers. So a lot of people are, you know, consuming all types of different substance at clinical and subclinical doses by drinking tap water. And they need to be aware of that. And they need to know that if they want to get that out, they need very strong filtration methods. The Brita filter, the pure filter, it might inc- in- improve the flavor of the water, but it's not taking that stuff out. It's not removing You need to get... Say again? No, it's not removing it all, really it, at all. It cannot. It cannot. No, that kind of filtration, carbon block filtration works great if you're starting with pretty clean water. But when you have microscopic, you know, uh, molecular um, sized particles like this, they're not coming out in that kind of filtration. So you need filtration like reverse osmosis or distillation. And unfortunately, Here's the flip of those. Those kind of filtration methods create a water that's so stripped of things uh-huh. that it's toxic too. Is it toxic because it's stripped of everything or is it toxic because there's still some sort of remnants of uh, toxic mm. chemicals in there? Good question. So, and there's an article up on my website, dannyvitalis.com, a couple couple blog posts back uh, specifically on demineralized water if people want to go deeper into this, but I'll, I'll try to break it down really quickly. Water is a solvent. It's a liquid solvent, and a solvent is something that dissolves other things. So, uh, let's say that you, um, you get some very clean water and you stick a rock in there, you know, and then later you take that rock out and you analyze that water. There's some of that rock in the water now as the water eats away at the rock. It eats away at everything. Earlier, we talked about how water is sort of the enemy of technology very often Mm -hmm. because it eats stuff, right? It oxidizes stuff. It causes your car to rust. It eats your car, right? So water wants to dissolve things into it. Because of this, when we look around the natural world, we never encounter water as pure H2O. Pure H2O only exists in laboratory settings, but it does not exist in nature. So water and H2O are really different things. H2O is the equivalent of, let's say it's, it's white, let's say, let's say that water is uh, sugar cane plants mm-hmm. and H2O is white sugar. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because, right? Because H2O is a refined out of water. H2O, if we distill water, we get pure H2O, but it, we can't find that in nature. Nature always has water with other stuff mixed in it, minerals organisms, but it's never pure in it. So H2O or distilled water is essentially a laboratory water, or I like to call it a pharmaceutical water Interesting. or a processed water. We, if that makes sense, it's a, it's a medicine, it's a industrial quality water. Now that H2O incidentally distilled water was invented by alchemists and later it was used uh, in laboratory settings because you need this incredibly pure water for certain kind of lab processes. Um, And reverse osmosis is just like distillation in a lot of ways. It's uh, a mechanical form of distillation. It's done through a filtration method, but it creates water almost as clean. Now when you get water that clean, Uh it's so empty that it wants to aggressively attack things to dissolve things into itself it becomes more of a solvent and when you drink it what it does is it starts basically stripping away minerals from your body so you put pure h2o in like distilled or reverse osmosis water but when you pee pure water doesn't come out what comes out water with minerals in it and all kinds of other stuff dissolved in and if you keep doing that you lose minerals you lose mineral another word for minerals we'll say electrolytes which are electrically charged uh, um mineral ions. You start to pee that out. So I, I linked on my website a World Health Organization report on the problems with drinking uh, distilled water, particularly in children. It's a serious problem um, because a lot of the developing world is using things like desalination or reverse osmosis to clean up their water supply. And unfortunately, they're not remineralizing the water and it's making people sick. So they've connected that incredibly clean water to a lot of disease processes as well. So it's, it's a, a catch-22. Right. Is that why it's- it's kind of called uh, a male water because it's more aggressive and uh, corrosive inside the body. Is that the idea yep, there? Some people have called it that because you end up with essentially what I, th- I like to think of the water that has been stripped down as being aggressive. And that's actually the term that hydrologists will use. It becomes an aggressive solvent. Um, and one of the concerns is that it can damage your arteries um, over time. Would as distilled well. water so, be good for like, a, let's say you want to do maybe a tea or something or put some drops of zeolite or something, would that be a good channel for, water, for, uh, for those medicines? 
I think for the lay person in your kitchen, I don't think it would matter much the benefit that you would receive from that. Okay. Uh, in making a tea, I think you're better off to work with better water if you have it. But here's the thing. Let's say that you live in downtown LA or downtown Manhattan and the water you have access to is either water you put through reverse osmosis or reverse osmosis or distillation at home uh-huh. or a lot of people now you probably have seen you can go to say a health food store that has a reverse osmosis fill it almost looks like a soda machine mm-hmm. um, but you bring your bottle and you can fill up and it basically takes tap water puts it through ro and you you know you put money in the machine and reverse osmosis water comes out of it they have one at the whole foods here in maine where i live um if that's the water that you have what you want to do is get yourself a TDS meter. That's a total dissolved solids meter. Very inexpensive. I have them on my website. I think they're about $25. Okay. Um, they'll last you many, many years. And wh- what they do is you, you put this meter in the water. It has an anode and a cathode, two little metal um, prongs. Those metal prongs want to send uh, an electrical impulse between themselves. You can think of the uh, anode as female and the cathode as male. They, they want to, one is positively charged, one's negatively charged, and they want to communicate electrically. In order to do that, they need to be put into something that's conductive. This is, um, y- you know, you mentioned sort of some of the mystical or I like to say esoteric qualities of water when we started the call. So here's one for people who are listening. We always are taught that water is conductive. You know that idea like don't let a, an electrically charged item fall in water with you? Mm. <laughs> don't be in the water when there's a lightning storm. Right. Because <laughs> water conducts electricity, right? So the idea is if you're in the bathtub and you're listening to, you know, the DVD player and it falls in the water with you and it's and it's plugged in, you'd be electrocuted. But if you were in water that was truly pure H2O, it does not conduct electricity. Really? Water is an insulator at the H2O molecular level. It's an insulator. What makes water conduct electricity is not the water. It's the electrolytes in the water. That's why they're called electrolytes. Interesting. Okay. Because they are electrically conductive. So if we took pure H2O and we stuck a wire in there, it would conduct no electricity. As soon as we dropped some salt in that water, the sodium chloride would become ions, electrolytes, and immediately that water would conduct electricity now. So here's what I, why this matters. The TDS meter, when you stick it in distilled water, is going to get a very low reading. It might get a zero if it was perfectly distilled. Okay. It'll probably get a four, five, six, seven parts per million. It's reading how much salt or electrolytes are in that water. Natural water is going to read much higher. Like, for instance, if we went to a good spring, we would get water that, let's say, it had a parts per million of, of dissolved minerals of 100. Mm-hmm. But distilled water is almost zero. RO water is almost zero. So what you can do is you bring home your, say, your five-gallon you know, container of reverse osmosis water, and you take a very clean sea salt, like a Himalayan sea salt or a Celtic sea salt, and you put the TDS meter in there and you see what your base reading is. Let's say you get a reading of 10. Now you start sprinkling little amounts of salt in there and stirring that up until you bring the reading up around 100 or 150. Now you've taken that water and you've remineralized it. And now it's a much safer water to drink. Does that make sense? You think I explained that clearly enough? Because I want to make sure people get that. Yeah, and I think people also do that with like lemon. If they have distilled water, the, uh, you know, people will add lemon to their water. Is that kind of the same idea? The value of adding lemon, it's a different idea because you're going to get far less of the electrolytes this way. But okay. the value of adding lemon is this. Water is more hydrating when it's acidic. Water is more hydrating when it's acidic. You can tell this because instinctively you know if it's really hot outside, do you think if I gave you 250 milliliters of water or 250 milliliters of water with lemon, which is going to quench your thirst better? No would, question, it's the lemon. It's yeah. the, the, the acids make you feel hydrated. That's why citrus fruits feel so hydrating. Mm. So often when people have a low quality water, the water doesn't hydrate them. Reverse osmosis and distilled water, interestingly, um, and this is even in that World Health Organization report, people don't feel their, their thirst gets quenched by it. So what happens is you can keep drinking that water all day long and you never feel like satisfied from it. That's why when you go to a restaurant and a restaurant serves either RO water or that say they serve tap water, they'll put lemon in it. You go to a hotel, they'll put lemon in your water because a slice of lemon because it makes their water seem better. <laughs> that's <laughs> that like to sense. fake you out, right? Yeah. Well, we're yeah, with well, because the, you'll feel more hydrated. Yeah, yeah. No, that's just fascinating. And we're going to get to talking uh, with Daniel about many more subjects 
uh, subject matter is about water. And don't forget to check out his website. We're going to take a little break here. His website is danielvitalis.com and surthrival.com as well, where he's got the TDS meters and all kinds of really great things. And uh, he's recently relaunched the website findaspring.com, which is where Kate and I get the map to go to our spring. So yeah, uh, congratulations on that. And we'll be talking to him about that after this break. So don't forget to check out danielvitalis.com. It was really cool. A while back, we had Deborah Lynn Dad on our show, and that was episode number 45. She's kind of like the queen of detoxification and getting toxins and chemicals and poisons and drugs out of your body and out of your home. She has a really, really great website. And again, that was extremehealthradio.com slash 45, her interview that we had. And she turned us on to a really cool product. It's a natural zeolite, which is pretty amazing, actually. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, you can check it out at extremehealthradio.com slash zeolite. That's Z-E-O-L-I-T-E. That will redirect you to this really cool product that she uh, turned us on to. And I talked with her at length about it. And I've been doing a lot of research about it. And zeolites are adsorptive. So they're positively charged. And they bind to anything that's negatively charged, which is like toxins and poisons and chemicals and all these things that we're exposed to. And what they do is they just pull them out of your bloodstream. The size of the zeolite molecule is really important too. So the smaller the size, the more powerful and the more toxins it's going to grab onto and flush out of your body. And this one I think is 0.03 microns, which is really, really small. I think it's the smallest in the industry from what I've learned and from what I've researched. So it's really, really a cool product. And if you're living in the modern world and want to get these heavy metals and toxins and poisons out of your bloodstream, check it out. Extremehealthradio.com slash zeolite. And it's about, I think, $24 per month for a bottle. And it's really a great way to get rid of these toxins and poisons out of your bloodstream and capillaries and out of the cells and all that kind of stuff. And we really, really liked the product and spoke with the company and trust Deborah. She's done a lot of great work. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, check it out, extremehealthradio.com slash zeolite, or you can read about it more on our store as well. And thanks for listening and let's get back to the show. 100% listener supported. Extreme Health Radio. Opening minds and transforming lives worldwide. worldwide. Don't forget to join our thriving community for health tips, inspiration, and show updates at extremehealthradio.com slash Facebook. All right, we're having a great time here with Daniel Vitalis from danielvitalis.com, and he's a very interesting guy. And for those of you that may be wanting to take notes or anything like that, this is episode number 121, so uh, you can check out any of the references on extremehealthradio.com slash 121. And Daniel is quite the water shaman, isn't he? <laughs> oh, excellent <laughs> use of verbiage there. <laughs> he is. He knows more about water than I think anyone. Oh my gosh, he's so fascinating. And yeah. This information about water is really crazy. Isn't yeah, it? I never knew half of this, and I'm just finding it all just a lot to take in. Yeah, really great. And his website, for those of you that are interested, is danielvitalis.com, and surthrival.com is also a website of his. That's where he sells all of his products. And if you'd like to support us, you can buy any of his products if you're interested uh, through our link, which is extremehealthradio.com slash surthrival. And that would be a great way to support us. And uh, right now we have a listener question, Daniel, that I want to play for you. So I'm going to cue that up and we'll play it right now. Okay, this is from Victoria and she is in Canada. So let me go ahead and play it and make sure you can listen to it. We'll start it right now. Hi, my name is Victoria and I'm calling from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We've just had a massive flood in our bow and adjoining elbow rivers here in Calgary and there's been quite a few homes unfortunately taken out and a lot of debris in our river itself. It's also affected a lot of southern Alberta and at uh, the moment there's also a train that's become derailed that's carrying diesel fuel. Now the city is telling us that it is safe to drink the tap water. I have a scent TV a filter. Uh, if you have any perspective on those, that would be great to hear that. I know that in Canmore there's great spring water, but right now we can't get up there and uh, there was massive flooding there and taking out a lot of homes as well. So um, if you have any comments or suggestions of what we 
can do here in Calgary, that would be wonderful. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Okay, Daniel, were you able to hear that? Yeah, powerful question. I, um, I, you know, I go to Calgary every year, um, sometimes a couple times a year uh-huh. to do speaking engagements. And um, yeah, a, the, a very good friend of mine's lost his home in that flood on the Bowness River. Now, the challenge is, how's my audio sound to you right now, Justin? It sounds pretty good, actually. Okay, I'm hearing that little echo on my end. Okay. Um, so the, the challenge is I don't know what their water supply, where their water comes from. Mm. If their water is coming from the water table, surface water, then I would be concerned about there being some stuff in that water for some time. And I would definitely be looking at using her filter. I don't know the specific filter and I don't know where Calgary gets their water. But it, this brings up a really good point, which is that spring water, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, comes up through uh, cracks in the bedrock from deep below the bedrock in aquifers. And that water does not get contaminated when, say, a diesel truck spills diesel into the water table. Okay. It doesn't affect a spring, but it does affect dug wells. It does affect water that comes from rivers and streams and creeks and things like that. Interesting. Okay. Well, so that, she's, that makes sense. Yeah, so she's having some issues. Uh, I think her... Uh, People are telling her that the water's safe and all this mm. kind of thing. And, and right. You know, and it, what she needs to find out is where does Calgary source its water from? That's what's going to help her determine. If they're sourcing water, let's say, from rivers that are upstream of this, then it shouldn't be a problem. If they're sourcing water downstream of this, then that's a problem. If their water is coming from the ground table, uh, sorry, from groundwater, surface water, I mean, there, then that's going to be an issue. So she's going to have to look into what Calgary's water source is. Okay, interesting. So with the water, I guess it really depends on a lot of different factors for people. You know, some people are going to be saying to themselves, well, I'd love to go to a spring, but you know, it's really not practical. But so they're looking at either going to the store and getting some sparklets or getting maybe distilled. Um, It sounds like distilled wouldn't be something you want to do long term. So would they just want to do as much water shamanism as they possibly could? You know? <laughs> well, this is what, let, let me do this, Justin. Let me say a little bit about bottled water. And then I want to get into all the solutions of what people can do. Oh, excellent. I, it's, it's not going to be as scary as I think. So as I was saying, there's a, a bunch of solutions and I want to get into all those, but I want to hit on one more piece because we said that, you know, uh, people are getting their water tipped either from the tap or from bottled water. So I just want to hit on the bottled water industry for a second because obviously I'm not even going to go into the pollution issues with bottles and plastic and all that. I think we know that. Mm -hmm. The, The main thing though I want people to take away from actually two points. One is that we don't really have any spring water companies in the United States. What we have are well water companies. Um, This took me a little digging to uncover, but I live real close to Poland Spring, which is one of the famous, you know, water sources for the United States uh, for bottled waters. Um, And what I came to learn was that Poland Spring is not really Poland Spring. It's Poland Springs, plural. um, And it's actually not Poland Springs at all. It's Poland Wells. (laughs) And what the, what the spring water industry did was they, they through lobbying, and through really, I mean, I think we, we're naive to think we don't live in, in a fascist country right now. We do. That's the merger of, of corporate and state power. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see it with, you know, things like what I'm about to talk about, which is that the spring water companies lobbied, changed the laws, and now they're able to call wells springs. Huh. They, they, if they can so, sort of show to some very weak standards that the water they're getting out of their well is similar to the water that was near a spring there, then they can call it spring. So what they do is they create something called a borehole. So Poland Spring, as an example, will come to s- local areas like the town that I live in uh, and, a- and try to buy a piece of property where they will then drill a borehole uh, where they will then suck water and pump water up out of the water table here and they will put that in bottles and call it Poland Springs. Um, And they sell it as spring water. Now, that's everybody in the United States barring a very few small exceptions. Uh Nearly all of the bottled waters that are called spring waters, despite the picture on the label of the mountain with the water running down it, these are well operations and boreholes. They're industrial. It's sort of like how oil is taken out of the ground, right? Right, It's It's a similar thing. And we think of them, I guess, you know, when we hear the word spring, that brings up some incredibly positive sensations in the body. But if we change the word to well, if I say Poland well water, 
If I say Fiji well water, uh-huh. are you going to pay $6 a liter for well water? I mean, that seems like a stretch. Hmm. But when we call it spring water, now it has this sort of, we know that that's good. So when we hear it, we think, hey, okay, it's worth it. And so people spend $6 a bottle on well water when they probably have friends who have wells and they could go fill up at their well uh, and get water just as good. So that's one piece of it. But the second piece is, of course, that plastic is, is dissolved by water, just like everything else we've been talking about. Water is a solvent. So one of the main issues with drinking bottled water is that people end up consuming a lot of plastic over time. And, and in very, very minute quantities, these plastic molecules are endocrine system disruptors. Let's say it again. They are endocrine system disruptors, and this is really interfering with human fertility. Mm. Uh, it, it's really interfering with uh, testosterone levels in males. It's really interfering with sperm counts in males. It's interfering with women being able to get pregnant, and it's driving female reproductive cancers. So plastic is a culprit in breast cancer, cervical cancer, fibroid tumors, all of these kind of endocrine system and gonadal uh, cancers, they're mm-hmm. driven by estrogens. And the thing about plastics is most petrochemicals, when they get in our body, are estrogen m- mimickers. So uh-huh. they're, we call them um, xenoestrogens, foreign estrogen molecules. And that's one of the problems with plastics. And for people who live exclusively on bottled water, glass bottled water is very expensive. And it's hard to ship it. And so it, the price is very high. So most people who drink bottled water do drink it out of plastics. The thing I really want people to remember about plastics and keep in their mind, we all know that plastic doesn't biodegrade. We all know it's not biodegradable. Mm-hmm. But most people haven't thought really about biodegradable, what that means. I think people hear biodegradable and they have it sort of linked to recycling or something in their head. And they don't think about what the word means. But the word means bio, life, degrades it. means life forms can eat it. Okay. So plastic can't be eaten by life forms very effectively. And so when we put it, if we throw a cabbage in a landfill, as long as we don't bury it too deep, organisms can eat that cabbage and eventually that cabbage will go away. That'll even happen with paper, right? We can throw paper in a landfill and organisms will eat that. Right, right. right? It, it's a food. It's a sh- basically paper sh- but petrochemicals don't get eaten well by organisms. And so they, that's why they stick around so long. But Plastic is a photodegrader. That means light, photo, photons, light breaks plastic down. And so if you were to take a plastic, say you bought two bottles of water in plastic, identical bottles, you leave one out in the sun and you put one in the darkness, you come back a couple days later to drink them, the one that's in the sun is going to taste a lot more like plastic because the sun is breaking the plastic down and the, the water's dissolving it as it breaks down. Is it more the sun? It must be the actual photons and, and versus the heat then. It's, it's light itself. So yeah, okay. you, you know, heat is less of an issue. Plastics are tolerant to heat okay. up to a point, but they're not tolerant to light. And so that's the critical piece here. That pla- you see that with, um, say that you put a tarp on something. Or you see it out in Southern California all the time, old plastic things that have basically been broken down by the sun. You Mm -hmm. put one of those blue tarps out over something, and a couple of years later, it's got holes in it from the sun. The, the, the plastic is broken down by, by light. So if you are drinking anything out of plastic, you've got to keep it protected from light. The, the thing that's really helpful is to think of it almost like it's wine. You don't leave your wine out in the sun, right? <laughs> you put wine in the cool, dark basement. You don't keep your water out in the sun. Now, here's another piece. Water, if it's allowed to sit in sunlight and it's natural water, natural water has microbes in it. Particularly, it has microalgaes in it. And algaes are very good for us. That's why things like chlorella and spirulina are great nutritional sources because we can eat algaes. Algaes are microflora. They're small plants. And that's good for us. And there are microalgae in water. Now, if we leave natural water out in the sunlight, those algae will start to photosynthesize that light. They'll start to create... Um, they're, they'll turn green, basically, right? The, their chlorophyll will turn green. Right, right. So, and you know that if you uh, live in a place where people have pools, if you don't put chlorine, now we're back to this chlorine story, right? Uh-huh. If you don't put chlorine in the pool or some other antibiotic, the organisms in the pool will turn green and they'll start to grow and they'll start to thicken the water. We've actually had that happen to our spring water mm-hmm. before. Uh, I think just once, right? Yeah, just once. And uh, so is that safe to drink, do you think? Now, okay, 
Do I recommend you drink it? No. Is it safe to drink? Yeah. Okay. But here's the thing. This is why. Now, wh- why doesn't that happen to bottled water then? Right. right. Here it is out in the sunlight. Right. You leave, you leave, you can, by the way, if you put spring water in a cool, dark place, uh, you, you know, it, it won't ever grow algae. Uh-huh. Right? That, that happens in the sunlight. But um, just like they, the, in order to keep organisms from growing in tap water, they put chlorine, just like your pool. In order to te- keep organisms from growing in, um, water that comes in bottles, they use three different processes. They use one called submicron filtration, and that takes a lot of the stuff out. Then they either treat it with ozone or they treat it with ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light scrambles the DNA of the organisms in there so they can't reproduce, and the ozone oxidizes them. So these processes are used to, to basically, I call it pasteurizing water or sterilizing water, Okay. right? I like to think of it as pasteurized. If they cook the water, essentially, they sterilize it so that they can put it on shelves and it can sit for years and years and it, it's dead. It cannot grow life forms. It might seem like it's not good that your spring water grew algae, but it actually tells you that that's a living water. It's a water that, that can, can support life forms. It's wow. a living water. The water that comes in these bottles has been sterilized. Um, what the effects of that are, we don't really know. It's, it's, it's kind of a new thing. So don't really know yet. But I know that um, studies are linking, and we talked about this in our last call when we did, we talked about soil microbes. And it's the same with water microbes. These algaes and bacteria that are found in natural water are important to our physiology. And often we find that they help us produce neurotransmitters that put us in a better mood. And so when people are deprived of these naturally occurring organisms, they don't make as much serotonin. And we know who all those people are in our lives. So this, so there's some problems with the bottled water industry. One, they're lying to us and calling well water spring water. Uh-huh. Two, the water's contaminated with xenoestrogens, which are driving cancers and destroying human fertility. And three, they sterilize that water. So it's not water that just comes from a spring. And I know about this because I got involved with a project in Maine with a specific spring, one that Poland Springs has been trying to buy for a long time. It was uh-huh. a competitor at one point because they're right down the road from each other but this spring was never changed contaminated never drilled and we were able to get special licensing from the state to gravity feed that water into the bottle with no filtration and we called that product raw water then we had a lot of challenges because we couldn't distribute it widely because it was in glass bottles and we just didn't have the distribution Uh but we were able to do it and through that process found out we were the only ones doing that so that really tuned me into the fact that everybody else out there is either drilling out their spring and or their, you know, going through these cooking, filtration, and pasteurization methods. So what we're left with is this. The human beings, on, uh, at least in our culture, are living off dead, processed, sterilized, pasteurized, or stripped down toxic waters. And that's our blood. And if we want to be healthy, I think it's more important that your water's good, then that your food's good. And if that sounds crazy, but I mean, you know, as you guys know, I believe in really, really good, clean food. Absolutely. I'm really into food. I'm into food at the genetic level, which I think is past <laughs> what most people are interested in it. But you t- ask me this question, if you said, Daniel, what's more important in a fish tank, the quality of the fish food or the quality of the water? I got to tell you, it's the water. It's got to right? be the water. It's got to be the water. You can't put chemically laden, dirty, crappy water in a fish tank and then put premium organic fish flakes in there and have healthy fish. Mm -hmm. But if you had really good water and the fish lived in really, really good water and you gave them kind of crappy fish flakes, they'd still be pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. Now, you can liken your cells to the fish and your blood and your cerebral spinal fluid and your intracellular fluid and lymph to the water. So you're a fish tank. And the quality of the water is more important than the quality of the food, my opinion. That is so interesting. There is just so many issues going on with water that people have no idea. They're about to. They're about to because that's the, we yeah. know it. I mean, who, the wars of the future will be not over oil, but over water. Mm. And it's starting already and we're going to continue to see it. I personally saw it. I was traveling in Ecuador at one point. Uh-huh. And we were planning to go to a hot spring. So we were traveling through uh, the forest and we got to a place where they, the road was barricaded off because two villages were having a war over water rights. Really? And we couldn't pass because it was too dangerous and we had to turn around. Now, that's starting to happen around the world and we're going to start seeing it. And the other thing we're seeing, and this is already underway and I don't need to belabor this point too much, but 
there are many corporate interests that want to control water completely. This thing of, if we don't turn this thing around, if we don't turn this ship around, personally, I think the ship's going to sink. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like I said in the beginning, but, but if we don't <laughs> turn this thing or change this thing, there'll be a day where you'll be describing to young people a day when water was free. Okay, that's They scary. won't even understand it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they won't understand it because water will be like so many other things in the world, completely controlled at the corporate level. And if that sounds crazy, then you just pull up some interviews with Nestle CEO and watch them on YouTube and hear what they have to say. Oh. Read what the World Health Organization has to say on water. Find out what's actually being said because there are powers and forces and principalities behind the scenes who are trying to determine how they can completely control water. And they're starting in third world countries. And they're working their way back to us. Oh, that's so interesting. We have a couple questions here. I won't get in too far into them, but they just wanted to know what filters, if you can recommend any brands that filter fluoride. Is Are there any things that you, brands that you might know of? Um, so th <laughs> this is such a challenge to me. <laughs> so I am, um, I don't want to say I'm ethically aligned against filters because that's certainly not true, but filtration is not my strategy with water. Okay. So I don't have a lot of answers on that. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll say is I'll present what my solutions are in a few minutes. So, um, and, and interesting that, you know, when we talk about problems, the way we solve problems, remember before I was talking about solvents right. and water is a solvent. We think of a problem as a thing that needs to be dissolved. And when you dissolve something into water, it's called a solution, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? It. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll share what my solution is and how I personally solve or dissolve this problem, Yeah. Uh, which is slightly different than going the filtration method, uh, filtration route method. Okay. Now, I think that filtration is going to be valuable for a lot of people. I don't have... My, I don't have expertise there, so I would be doing a disservice to try to answer this. But what I will say is that you need something stronger than you know the Walmart filter and beyond that. I just haven't looked into it enough. Okay, okay. That's fair enough because fair enough. if your strategy is something beyond that, I think the goal here is to get other people's strategy to realize, for them to realize how important water is and just say, you know what? Filters are great, but I'm going to go for a strategy above that. Uh, well, really I want to, I want to again, use the metaphor of food. Now, here's the thing. If you asked me, you guys know my philosophy on food and we talked about it in the last call and I'm really into genetically clean food. I'm really into food that's grown locally and real soil. Mm -hmm. If you asked me what would be a good, um, what would be the best synthetic vitamin and mineral supplement or what would be the best powdered food replacement meal? I wouldn't know because I eat food. When people want to know the best artificial processed water, I don't have a lot of answers there because mm -hmm. I don't, that's not, to me, it's the same thing. I know that sounds crazy because it's new information to people, but just like there's whole food and processed food, there's whole water and processed water. Uh -huh. And I'm, my expertise is in whole water and filtered water is a processed water. And I don't have a lot of expertise there, just like I don't have a lot of examples of the healthiest processed food. Yeah, that would be like asking you, do you like Tylenol or Bayer? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know, it's not really- I don't even, yeah. In fact, in the medical class I'm taking, as I was talking to you about before, my biggest challenge is on the medical, the medication piece, because I don't know anything about it, because I don't <laughs> do it. So it's, I struggle there. That's so true. Interesting, okay. So what are some of your uh, mm -hmm. solutions that you do now for your water? Well, here's the thing. Let's let's create because we're Westerners. Let's make a best to worst hierarchical list. Yes, those <laughs> that's, are that's always good. How a lot of us think. Yeah. Um, my for me, there's no question that the best. I hope people make it this far into listening to the call because <laughs> it's this really important piece. Right, here. right. The best water, in my opinion, is water that comes from springs. Now, I don't say that because I'm some kind of freaky purist. Because honestly, I'm not. <laughs> I probably sound like one. <laughs> Why I say that is because water that comes from springs is water that's beneath the bedrock. It's important to understand. Let's give people three layers of water to think about. Okay. One is atmospheric. That's the water that's above the ground, right? Up, up in the atmosphere. That's the humidity in the air. Yeah, the that's the clouds. Then there's the surface water. This is water that's on the ground, but above the bedrock. 
above the rock layer of the earth. Okay. Then there's the water that's beneath that. We call it groundwater. It's below the bedrock. It's down deep in rock pockets. Those are called aquifers. Mm -hmm. Now, human beings have like as if it's some kind of crazy dystopic Mad Max future scenario, we have <laughs> contaminated our whole planet. The effects of that are not fully realized yet, but it's been done. Mm -hmm. And it's already done, right? It's like, we can, tr we can clean it up. We can dismantle all the nuclear power plants today, and that won't take away Fukushima, Chernobyl, and the 2,000 plus nuclear weapons that have been detonated on Earth. Mm-hmm. Right, we've uh, we we had a nuclear war in the form of testing weapons everywhere. That nuclear contamination is everywhere. Now, the water in the atmosphere and the water on the surface is contaminated everywhere, everywhere with PCBs, with radiation, with petrochemicals, with pesticide, chemtrails, with chemtrails because. Yeah or let's call it with geoengineering aerosol particulate. That's right. So we don't sound crazy. Um, the, <laughs> the, the thing about water, the great thing about water is it's a solvent, right? We said it's a solvent of life. The bad thing about it being a solvent is that it will dissolve and disperse things, right? Dif diffusion is the movement of things from greater concentration to lesser concentration. So these toxins have dispersed themselves around the world. That's why if we take a plug of polar bear fat, we find PCBs in it. Ah, okay. It's not like polar bears are hanging out down here, you know, <laughs> going out to bars in the cities. They're way up in the Arctic. How do they have these chemicals there? Because they can pass through everything and they're in the water. Now, the water that's under the bedrock, the aquifers, has been protected by that massive layer of rock and positive pressure. And it comes up to the surface as springs. Now, when it gets to the surface, it's pure, it's clean, and it's not being contaminated by any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. That means if you can gather it at the source and put it in a bottle, what you have is like the most magical. It's like, a, it's like you have a tincture of the old earth. Oh. It's like you have a pre-industrial elixir. It's like you have a substance that is from before human contamination of anything. So the earth mean? itself is actually your Brita water filter. The earth is a Brita water filter. Now, <laughs> I giggle at the Brita water filter watching somebody screw that onto the sink. If I lived in the city, I would have one on my sink. Okay. I don't mean to say that it, I just wouldn't use it for my drinking water. Mm -hmm. I would still want it for washing my dishes and all of that, right? I'd put one on my shower, but I, that wouldn't be my drinking water. Now, when you think about the earth as a filter compared to those Brita filters, I mean, it's a joke. It's a yeah. joke. Yeah, right? about even, a, even a really good filter because the earth is, a, is a, not just a, a chemical level filter. It's a biological filter. It's life forms mixed with rock material filtering stuff over the course of hundreds and thousands of years. But what's so the water, in, but the water in those spring pockets is ancient and it's uncontaminated. And this means, so let's go back to the original conversation, which was we're 60, 70% water. Uh-huh you have the opportunity to drink this spring water. Now, if you drank that spring water, that would mean that 60 to 70% of your body was made out of something pre-industrial, was made out of something that wasn't contaminated. So that means that at least 60 or 70%, let's say 65% of your body could be pure material. Wow. And you would be a bag of pure material walking through a world full of sacks of fetid poison toxin material. Oh. Those are all the other people who are sacks of dirty water. And you would be a sack of clean water. You would be a sack of clean water with a fully functional pineal gland in it. This could potentially make you in a world this crazy, almost like a superhuman, right? Almost a superhuman. Wow. You definitely would be atavistic. That's interesting too, how you were talking about the filters, you know, with all those Brita filters and everything else, it's, it's all, you know, the water starts at the top and kind of uses gravity to go down. But when the water's in the, you know, in the oh, aquifer, the oh. yeah, it use it goes against gravity to come up, right? That's such yeah, a wild through concept. Capillary, capillary action. It's a very, very cool thing. Yeah. It's brought to the surface and it's brought to the surface in a flow. Oh, it's truly amazing. Anybody who hikes in the mountains, you know, I know that actually, strangely, we're at that time in history where there's a lot of people who've never hiked, but, <laughs> but for the people who've hiked in the mountains, you sometimes have to ask yourself, 
where are all these rivers coming from off these mountains? Is there a lake at the top of every mountain? How come every mountain has streams coming down over it, if we're not in the desert at least? Most mountains we go up to have forests on the top, and there are streams running down. Now, it doesn't rain every day, and there's no lake up there. Where is it coming from? It's coming from springs. And there's a whole other story in what you just, obviously you just highlighted something that goes to a, 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 there's a, there's another layer to this, which actually I'd be happy to touch on in a second. I just want to finish this point, which is in the hierarchy of water, you can't beat spring water, which is why those well water companies want to tell us their water spring water. Cause instinctively we know that uh-huh. instinctively we know that now there was a time where like, for instance, when Westerners arrived here uh, in North America, you could have basically drank water from any river, lake, or stream you wanted to. Today, this isn't true. We actually have to follow those to their sources to get that clean water. That's why I created, and just I'll plug it here, findaspring.com, free website. Go there. It's a database, a Google map of springs. Now, like you said, we just rebuilt that website. So here's how it works. You pull up a map of the world and all these springs are on there. You click on the spring and you get data about that spring and how to get there. Now, you can go there and you can communicate with other people who've been drinking that water and find out if that water's right for you. And you can go there, drive your car right up there, get your bottle, go out, fill it up, bring home that clean water, build yourself out of it. Mm-hmm. I like to tell people if you only did this one time, like for instance, if you went and filled up a five gallon carboy of water, those, those big fountain bottles are called carboys. Mm-hmm. If you filled up one five gallon bottle and you drank that, it would be like the ultimate oil change, right? You'd be, you'd be remade. It's like a rebirth. It's like a baptism, that makes sense. Wow. Right? You'd rebuild yourself completely. You'd flush out all your old water. You'd put in all this new water. I think one time would be valuable. But if you did that once a, let's say you did that four times a year, how valuable is that? What if you did it once a month? What if once a month you drove out to a spring um, that was within, let's say, an hour of your, where you live? Um, sometimes for me, it's 10 minutes. For some people I know, it's, they've got one in the yard. For some people, they drive two hours. I've met a guy who flies his Cessna to a spring. Oh so anyway, you find a spring, <laughs> you fill up your bottles, you bring enough bottles to get a month's supply, and now you only have to go once a month, right? So that's a strategy in and of itself, and that's why I created findaspring.com. And if you find springs or know of springs that aren't on that map, you can submit them, and that's how we build that database. So that's a really great resource. Again, source is the French word for a spring. So resource. I love it. That's <laughs> what we use all the time. We use that website we all totally the time. We totally do. Yeah. Great. Thank website. you. I hope you like the new site. And we're, we're looking for feedback too on that site because obviously it's new. So we're, we're working out all the kinks still. Um, my next level strategy, if I couldn't get to a spring, uh-huh. I would be looking for friends that have drilled wells. Okay. I would be looking for a drilled well. A drilled well, now there's two kinds of wells. One's called a dug well. I have one here on my property. That's where people dig down. If you've ever gone to the beach and you've dug down into the beach sand until water starts to fill in because you're at the water table, Uh that's like what a dug well is. So a dug well is an old technology. You dig a hole until you get down to the water table and that fills in with water. Now the problem with that is that's that surface water we talked about before. So that water will be contaminated with what's whatever is in your environment there. So if you live near the coal plant or if you live near, you know, the paper mill, that water is going to be contaminated with that stuff. But a drilled well is an artificial spring. And that's where the bedrock is drilled and you drill down into a water vein and the water that comes up to your well is basically like an immature spring almost. I see. It's like an artificial spring. Now, if you know somebody with water like that and it's good quality water, then you've got basically something very close to spring water that still comes from the ecosystem and you can fill that up. So that would be my next strategy. So well water can be considered or likened to like maybe like a premature baby kind of thing? I think of it almost like an unripe fruit. Okay. It's almost like an unripe water. I, like I say that because that water has not been brought to the surface by itself yet. Okay. And a lot of people are going to hear that and go like, that's crazy. What's he talking about? But here's the thing. Um, for people who are listening who've lived in rural areas, what they'll know is that a lot of the people who have wells have a well that smells like eggs because it's really rich in sulfur. Right. Or they'll have a, a well that stains all of their, their fixtures with iron posits because it's too high in iron. Mm-hmm. Or they'll have, uh, there could be so much calcium, magnesium, contamination of that water because that water hasn't cleaned itself completely on its journey to the surface. Typically, springs aren't like that. Typically, springs are very clean water most often because that water's come up by itself and it's basically shagged off all its minerals. It's shed all those minerals. 
and it comes up very low and it comes up with the healthy ratio of electrolytes. I see. Okay. So sometimes wells, you drill into them and that water is not really ready to come up. So, but I would choose that water over a host of other waters. Okay. I'd rather have water with too much minerals than not enough. Okay. So well water would be a good second choice. Yeah. And you can tell it's like that where it's like, this is really great. And that, well, uh, well, <laughs> it's got that yeah. kind of unsure quality to it, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, well means like, okay or good, right? Like okay. he's doing well. <laughs> right, right. So, so, so my true. next choice after that, but it's probably a toss up. I think after that, you're looking at probably bottling, bottled water or filtered water. Bottled water, I know a lot of people who get water from Mountain Valley Spring because they have a nationwide distribution in glass. Okay. It's a very high mineral water, so some people don't like it over the long term. They don't find it particularly hydrating, but it does come in glass and they'll deliver three gallon bottles to your door. So that's something to look into. Um, other glass bottles, some people like um, naturally carbonated mineral waters, um, they're expensive. Um, Plastic water, yeah, you know, I mean, there's times where I have to break down and do it, like especially um, traveling in airports. Mm -hmm, right. You know, and that's a piece I want to bring up here. Listening to this call, I know some people are going like, oh my God, oh my God, what do I do? Oh my God. <laughs> and, and the thing is, is that water is so important that even if you don't have the best water, you need to drink what you have because you have to. You have to, right? right? You can't not drink water. You can't fast off water for very long. Mm -hmm. um, you'll, you know, even if, if all you had access to, if I had a cup of dirty water and you had no water, they'll come that moment where you'll trade me everything you own in this earth for it. That's true. You have to. <laughs> so drink what water you have to drink. If you have access to only bottled water right now, choose good waters. Read where the source of that water is and ask yourself, is water from Fiji going to be better for me than water that came from Northern California? Mm -hmm. Ask yourself that. Um, the, the other piece would be if you have to filter, like I talked about earlier in the call, you basically want to remineralize that water. And just check out, that's all on the article on DanaVitalis.com um, on demineralized water. So take a look at that information and use, I like to use sea salts. There's other products out there on the market, but I think it's hard to beat the, the electrolytes that Earth chooses in its oceans. Um, so I would, I would look at using a sea salt to remineralize my water. So those would be my options there if I had to choose those. Now the next piece is how important is your health to you? If it's really important to you, you may want to consider relocating yourself to somewhere where you can have water sovereignty uh -huh. uh, because this reliance um, something I, you know, I haven't said this in a while, but I used to say this a lot in, in interviews I did years ago. Um, and it's this, LA is a temporary settlement. <laughs> Tucson's a temporary settlement. Phoenix is a temporary settlement. Las Vegas is a temporary settlement. Um, they, they like the Titanic, right? It's like, I keep bringing that metaphor up. I think it's a perfect metaphor in a lot of ways. You know, when they launched the Titanic, it was the ship that even God couldn't sink. Right, oh, right. The, the hubris Right? right, right. First voyage <laughs> sinks. Mm -hmm. So similarly, you could go, yeah, Phoenix has been here for a while though, buddy. Well, guess what? It's not going to last. It can't. There's no water there. <laughs> Vegas will, eventually that will be an abandoned city. They will be, mark my words. So when? Hard to say. Soon? I don't know. But where do you position yourself in the game of uh, musical chairs that's happening on earth right now? Where do you want to be? Um, I've chosen to position myself in a place where I have well water, which means I shower in well water. Uh -huh. I don't have to clean. I don't have to worry about that. I wash my dishes in well water. I don't have to think about um, chlorine. I don't have to think about filtration. And that's a choice that I, I made and I really believe me, I don't regret it because I've lived on municipal water and I travel and I know what that's like when I first have to go into a place and I have to take a shower in chlorinated water. Believe me, <laughs> it's really noticeable when you don't yeah. do it for a while. And if the, you know, life, you desensitized. if the life of the flesh is in the blood and your blood is built on water, how important is your life to you, right? Exactly. And um, how much energy do you want to have to put into fixing something when you actually there's the option to actually go to something that already works. That makes sense, right? It's like, <laughs> I don't know, like how much energy do you want to put into having to fix the water around you? The very basic, it's just so hard. And you guys know it. It's so hard because we live in such a virtual world right now that we forget how reliant we are on this stuff. So right. 
you know, people don't think water is that big a deal. It's actually the biggest deal after air. Air, biggest deal. Second biggest deal, water. Guaranteed. No question. But you don't know that if you've lived your whole life with everything available all the time. But the, you know, things are changing and, mm-hmm. and we'll see them change in our lifetime in a big way. So, um, yeah, so that, that's my hierarchy. Spring water, first choice. My second choice, well water. I have a great well here and I'll drink that water if um, I don't have access to spring water. Okay. So, and after that, I would look at filtration bottling as, as two options um, that, you know, there's 7 billion people and a lot of them are going to just have to do this stuff. And for the people who are here, I mean, sometimes I get these people who are like, you know, they'll go off on me, the internet trolls and say like, well, there's 7 billion people. They can't all do this. I'm not trying to get 7 people to drink spring water. I'm right. trying to get the people who are worth saving to drink spring water personally. Mm-hmm. So, Wow. Yeah, there's something to be said about that. And I think that when you start drinking the spring water, it really does, uh, there, there must be some kind of electrical charge there or there's something going on because when you drink it, you feel we different. Feel the difference for sure. Yeah, you, your mind opens and uh, we're really just honored to have find a spring uh, yeah. available to us because man that website is you know to me worth millions of dollars because mm-hmm. without it we would never have been able to find our spring you know and, and it's the difference of, of I mean I don't know how else to say it. it's like you go to the goddess Gaia for your water the living planet and she freely gives you the overflow of her bounty uh-huh. or you go through sick twisted machines made by nincompoops who are obsessed with transhumanism and the, the controlling of nature and the, the controlling of humans. And you, you go with your little cup in hand for a drop of their poison. I mean, of course, you know, it's like crazy. Of course, there's a, of course, there's a difference. Like if there wasn't a difference, then check me out of here. I don't want to be here. There's got to be a difference, right? There's got to be something better than the way people are living. But, you know, it's sort of like, is there a difference between genetically modified, you know, Monsanto BT resistant corn and maize that the Maya grew? Is there a difference between, you know, a, a free a, a wild pheasant and the you know Kentucky Fried Chicken? <laughs> I'd hope so, right? Yeah. I'd hope you'd feel different. Yeah, that is amazing. So make sure to check out Daniel Vitalis, and we'll, and we'll put a link to the article that he referenced during the show about uh, all the waters. You know, the way you can remineralize your water and things. We'll put a link to that on this show page, which is uh, extremehealthradio.com slash one twenty one, and we'll also put a link to Find a Spring, and they're also doing a fundraiser there on Find a Spring. So if you wanted to donate, I believe there's uh, places to do- donate. And uh, check out that website. Uh, I appreciate website. bringing that up because our goal with that site is what we want to do is eventually be a nonprofit that goes from town to town helping towns um, turn their springs into parks and preserved lands. Um, so that's the ultimate goal. And, um, you know, we, we want to see people recognize because most of the springs I go to, it's amazing how they are in the back alleyway of the town like people forget don't know that they have any value. Yeah. And meanwhile, everybody's lining up to pay more for their water than gasoline and there's a spring down the street. No one's using it. It's for, just shocking. For free. Yeah, it's just amazing. For, for free and it's better water than they're buying. Yeah, wow. Thanks, Daniel, for spending some time with us. I know you're up against the clock yourself, so I want to pre- you know, just say thank you and we appreciate your time today. Big time. Can I, I, can I uh, close off with a little piece here? Sure. Um, you know, the, the Bible starts off as the second verse of the whole Bible. It says that um, the, the Spirit of God, this is prior to the earth's creation. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And this is, it says that God's Spirit moved across the face of the waters. And one has to ask themselves, like, what waters are they talking about? This is before the earth. What, what, what waters? And then we see all these cultures talk about water as the first thing that the universe is water. Mm -hmm. And that seems completely ridiculous at first. Then you start to look deeper and you realize that what the universe actually is made of almost entirely is hydrogen. Almost entirely, it's hydrogen. Almost completely. So much so that if we were going to do the average, basically the universe, or if we were going to, sorry, estimate it, you know, the, the universe is basically hydrogen. Hydrogen means to make water. Water we hear of is H2O. It's, it's two hydrogen molecules. It's basically what it is, is hydrogen gas, again, what the universe is basically made of. If you burn hydrogen gas, the ashes are water. 
That's why a hydrogen car, when it burns hydrogen, it, its exhaust is water. Uh -huh. The universe is basically water in its proto-unburned form. And when it burns or oxidizes, it turns into water. The earth is essentially made out of um, oxygen. It's, a, it's primarily oxygen. That's the most abundant thing on earth. The sun is primarily hydrogen. When they mate, what's created is water. When the universe burns through the energy of creation, it turns into water. The universe is made out of water. It's just in a form that's gaseous that we don't recognize. But water is the fundamental thing. I mean, if we were going to say, what's the universe really? It's hydrogen, the generator of water. That's what the universe is. And so we actually are embedded in the most sacred and magical substance. And it gives forth, it gives rise to life. And we've fallen so far from uh, wisdom, <laughs> even though we think we've gained all this understanding. Um, that we're blind to the fact that it's actually really all about water. Wow, that is fascinating. Golly, Whew. there's so it's much to it. My mind is reeling. And there's so much more that we didn't get into, which is like the uh, the impressions that people do on water and by putting like love on the outside of their water and the intention. And uh, man, it's just, it's so fascinating. Such a fascinating subject, such a seemingly simple substance, but it's not. But wow, Daniel, that was amazing. Hey guys, thanks for having me on again. Looking forward to uh, our third session. Well, thanks so much. And uh, I know you got to go, so we'll let you run. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Okay. Thanks, thanks Daniel. Daniel. Wow. Interesting with Daniel Vitalis on water, huh? Daniel Vitalis is a spring of water intelligence. <laughs> He's a water shamanism he is or a wa shaman. That's a great way to say that. Yeah. Maybe yeah, we'll title no. this the wa water shamanism or something. Oh, that'd be good. He'd like that. Yeah, he's a very fascinating guy. Ooh, I feel like my head's spinning right now. Yeah, and there's so much going on with water. And man, when I see people drinking tap water with no no filters, it makes it really think. It sure does. Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Just amazing, amazing stuff. So if you have the ability to go to findaspring.com or go to a spring that's in your area, please do that because it's really an amazing resource as you just heard and findaspring.com is completely free. You know, and it has been redone. It looks amazing from when we first started even using it. It's always been a great tool, but right now it looks really killer. Yeah, it's, it looks amazing and they've completely relaunched it uh, as of this recording. And um, do what you can to get as much spring water as you can. We, we have about six gallons that we use, uh, six gallon glass carboys that we take and we have a bunch of other glass bottles and we'll go to the spring probably once every couple months four times five times a year probably yeah four or five times a year it's and a couple in, hours away and you know in the meantime we'll do spring water from the store we'll do plastic stuff in the meantime but we try to go to the spring as much as we possibly can and this well, is like a, he was saying if you even do it once in your life let alone yeah as much as you can you're really helping yourself out so yeah, go on to findaspring.com and check out that resource for you so you can start getting some of the spring water yourself and just make it a practice and make it something that you ease into. You know, if you got, if all you have is plastic bottles, then take those and save up and get one glass one and then, you know, start save up the next time and yeah. just kind of do it as a practice and do it as a, as a way to build a discipline. Mm -hmm. Go out and get that spring water and, uh, and make it a fun trip if you're anywhere close for a road trip. It can be a fun day. You know, you and I go and we just make it listening to different shows and yeah. uh, talking about different ideas and stopping and getting some really great food. food and, and Yeah, we do a trip out of it. It takes us about an hour, I'd say an hour and, or no, probably a couple hours to get there. Yeah. And even about, more coming home. Yeah, we take the long way home, the back roads. <laughs> Woo, it's an adventure. It takes like four hours It takes to get a full home. day, yeah. It's, it's a, fun though. It's a full day, but if you do it once every few months, you know, it's... Like he said, what are you building your blood out of? Mm -hmm. You know, your blood is, you know, your heart pumps your blood to all your organs and carries oxygen rich uh, red blood cells and immune system white blood cells around. And, you know, what's the median right. that you're using to transport your immune system and things? Yep. So it's, it's pretty important. So anyway, I want to thank you for joining us on this show. And don't forget to visit findaspring.com and danielvitalis.com. And don't forget to check out our website, 
for more great shows like this. And this is going to be part two of our episode with Daniel Vitalis. So we'll be doing part three soon. And uh, what else? Any, uh, anything else to get to? Oh, if you can, if you could be so kind as to share this show with your friends, we uh, uh, gladly accept donations from you guys. If you can donate a couple dollars here or there, uh, that would be a huge thing. And um, if all of you guys did that, that would be very, very helpful to us. But we realize in today's economy, which is another subject for another show, you know, it's difficult out there. It's challenging, I should say, is a better term. So if you can't donate, please uh, send our show to your friends on Facebook and that share would help us out. Yeah, share our links. We'd be really, really appreciative of that. So I want to thank you guys all for being on the call. And if there's anything we could do for you, just let us know. And we hope you have a fabulous day drinking the best water you can possibly find. Speaking of water, we are going to go to the beach. Let's go jump in. Time to go to the beach. So thanks all for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. It's time to go for now. But our mission does not end with this show. Justin and Kate will be back with another interview packed full of ideas, discoveries and unique ways to regain your health. Head on over to extremehealthradio.com forward slash subscribe and instantly download our free gift too that contains cutting edge strategies to start making healthy lifestyle changes today. No material on this blog is intended to suggest that you should not seek professional medical care. Always work with qualified medical professionals, even as you educate yourself in the field of life, food, nutrition, and alternative medicine. I'm not a doctor, nor am I offering readers or listeners medical advice of any kind. None of the information offered here should be interpreted as a diagnosis of any disease, nor an attempt to treat or prevent any disease or condition. While information in this blog and during this podcast is discussed in the context of numerous conditions, it can be dangerous to take action based on any of the information on this podcast or in this blog, or to start any health program without first consulting a health professional. The content found here is for informational purposes only and is in no way intended as medical advice, as a substitute for medical counseling, or as a treatment or cure for any disease.